Welcome to the Billion Insights Podcast. I'm your host, Sri, and we have a very special guest with us today. His name is Andy Samotiak, an eminent U.S. and Canadian immigration lawyer with over 40 years of experience. He has helped over 10,000 clients navigate the complex world of immigration law. In addition to his legal work, he is also a former United Nations correspondent, a Forbes contributor, and the author of five books. So we are thrilled to have him here to share his insights and experiences with us today. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Randy. So welcome, sir. Welcome to the Billion Insights Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here with you. Thanks for joining us today, sir. Yeah, so I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to share some thoughts with you. We are excited. So, sir, can we start from the beginning? Let's start with your childhood. Okay. So, so you were born and raised in Canada, right? Yes, I was born in a city called Edmonton, Alberta, in Western Canada on the Canadian prairies. Hmm. That's where I grew up, went to school there. I was uh, Catholic in background, so I went to a Catholic school, hmm. actually Catholic school system through the whole system, and pretty much... Uh, did all my education there until until I finished high school and then moved on to uh, university at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. If I'm not mistaken, you are in your 70s, right? Yes, I am. Born in 1949, actually. Hmm. So you grew up in 60s Canada? Yes, yes. Maybe for many of your listeners, uh, you know, I might be a dinosaur in terms of uh, their age and their experience on Earth. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you'd be amazed how fast time goes by and you turn around in your, you know, in your 70s. Yesterday, you were a young kid, you know, uh, riding around in a car or uh, hitchhiking or, you know, going to school or whatever it may be. Oh, you have to make the best of every moment, which is what I try to do. Yep, yep. So, sir, how was this like growing up in Canada in the 60s? Well, uh, I'll tell you this. Actually, I grew up half-time in Canada, half-time in the United States. Hmm. My mother and I uh, lived in Canada. My father died when I was nine years old as a young kid. Oh. So my mother raised me. And uh, we were immigrants. That is to say, my parents were immigrants from Ukraine and hmm. came to Canada. My mother just after World War II. My father very early in uh, for Canadian times. He came in 1912, before World War One, and they met in Canada. I write about my background a bit in my book called A Promise Kept, A Tribute to a Mother's Love, which is on Amazon. All my books are on Amazon, by the way. But what I'm going to talk about is the childhood uh, stuff. And uh, so I spent half my time in Edmonton and half my time the summers and then high school in Los Angeles, where my aunt was, my mother's sister. And I was shuttled back and forth between the two countries. And indeed, my whole life has been half time in Canada, half time in the United States, whether it was in Los Angeles or in New York, where I worked. I worked, uh, for example, uh, later after uh, graduating from university and so on, uh, 10 years in Los Angeles and five years in New York. So my life is both U.S. and Canada. But as far as the early childhood is concerned, like for what it might be worth for uh, listeners, I, I remember, for example, um, in the 60s, in the early 60s, when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Now, recently we heard of an assassination attempt on uh, President Trump. Yeah. So back then it was President Kennedy, and that was a huge, huge deal. For even though I'm, you know, Canadian, uh, or was Canadian, even in Canada, indeed, probably in India as well, uh, the assassination of a president of the United States was quite an event. And, you know, so we lived through things like the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Soviet Union tried to, to place missiles in Cuba next door to the United States. And President Kennedy blocked them from doing that with a blockade, a naval blockade. And then, of course, the president's assassination, the, the swearing in of President Johnson in the United States uh, and his implementation of the civil rights uh, program that President Kennedy left him just as. President Kennedy wanted it. Johnson came along and implemented it just that way through Congress, which was quite a feat. 
and then we live through, uh, you know, later times. That's the political side. On the sort of just the personal side, I'll just share this, that uh, we were not a rich family. We're, you know, we were immigrants. That is to say, my parents were immigrants. My mother was deaf, so uh, it was hard for us, well, my mother in particular, and uh, my childhood years and into teenage years required me to help her in terms of dealing with the world, you know, communicating with the world. She could lip read, so, so, she, so she understood what people said to her because she could read their lips as they were talking. And she was intelligent. She read, you know, magazines and uh, books and so on, papers. So she was up to date on everything. But she had this uh, disability of not hearing what people were saying to her. And as I mentioned, my father died uh, when I was nine years old. So we were uh, left, uh, you know, the two of us on our own as I was growing up. But life was uh, fairly good, you know, uh, compared to a more difficult life back in Ukraine and uh, the Second World War that my mother lived through and my, my father's early life in Canada, living through the Great Depression and the two world wars. You know, as I came along and as I grew up, I had it easy compared to what they lived through. And uh, so that was my childhood in Edmonton. Mm. Yeah, I can totally see that your childhood must be tough. So, yeah. There were yeah, there were moments, you know, yeah. uh, put it this way. By the time, well, like in the early years when my father came to Canada and going through the two world wars, etc., cetera, uh, there was an extraordinary time. Uh, you know, my father, first of all, there was discrimination against Ukrainians that came to Canada. You know, uh, derision of us and, and, and uh, name calling my other relatives in the family uh, had to go to school under protection because the, the school children were attacking them, throwing rocks at them and so on uh, as early immigrants. Today, uh, Ukrainian Canadians no longer face that kind of, by and large, no longer face that kind of discrimination. But back then there was uh, that discrimination. You know, um, my father, when he came to Canada, Vasil William Simutyu, when he came to Canada, he came and worked on the railroad which was being, it was a national priority. So he was a, he was by virtue of his work as a foreman on the railroad, he was protected from some of the hardships that other Ukrainian immigrants uh, faced. For example, they were rounded up and put into internment camps across Canada because in World War I, they came from parts of Ukraine that were under Austro-Hungary and Austro-Hungary was an enemy of Canada and Great Britain. So they were regarded as suspected people, you know, suspect people who cannot be trusted. And uh, many of them were disposed of all their assets and put into these internment camps where they had to work forced labor, basically. And uh, to this day, for example, if you ever come to Banff, Alberta, where, which is a national park in Alberta, hmm. um, there's a, a, a special tribute paid to those who were in, in imprisoned in the internment camps. And uh, part of Banff was built by uh, Ukrainian, you know, immigrants who had been interned in a camp there. As just one example, uh, there were many internment mm -hmm. camps across across mm -hmm. Canada. So there, you know, there were those kind of hardships, not pleasant, but uh, somehow, you know, things were uh, corrected and, and uh, you know, we move on with our lives. Yeah, yeah. Adjusting to a new country and losing your father at a young age is must be challenging. But as they say, hard times create strong men. And uh, it's clear that you are not only emerged from those difficulties, but continue to thrive and grow stronger because of that experiences. Yeah, I'll, like I'll share this little insight into, you know, what motivated me uh, or how I sort of moved through life. And that was from an early age, I saw even from the beginnings of going to school and so on, mm -hmm. that the, uh, the respect that my parents had for education and for teachers and for school uh, was, was so high that I dared not uh, do anything wrong in school or cause any hardships of any kind, particularly because my mother because of her hearing impairment, 
would get very agitated if if there were any reports of any you know troubles on my part. So I had to kind of pay attention to what I was doing yeah. and kind of lead my life sort of uh, taking the initiative to do what was necessary to, you know, to promote me through grade one, two, three, four, five, you know, getting the report cards, getting everything done, filing all the forms and papers that were necessary and getting everything yeah. together in that regard. And uh, I, in turn, formed the same kind of respect for education and awe for my professors and teachers so that I made it a point. Like I, I would not dare go see and talk to a professor, especially about things like low marks or something, you know, or that I'm unhappy about what's going on in a school. Overly respectful of the system. Perhaps at times it faltering, but nonetheless, I, I never disputed a mark I got throughout my education. And I encountered uh, things, uh, I'll just share one story uh, to give you an idea. As I mentioned, I shuttled back and forth between Canada and the United States. Mm-hmm. And uh, so in grade nine, I entered high school in Los Angeles at Potter Noster High School, which was in Los Angeles. Uh, for those who might know Los Angeles, it's near San Fernando Road and Highway 2. Um, and uh, there they taught Latin, or they taught Spanish, and I had a choice. And I decided to study Latin, thinking this would help me greatly later if I ever become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. As it turned out, I think it was a mistake. I should have studied Spanish. But nonetheless, I studied Latin for a year in grade nine, which is when high school started in Los Angeles. And then I flipped over to the Canadian high school system in grade 10 and went into a school called O'Leary in Edmonton and signed up for Latin again first year Latin. So I'm in there thinking, oh, geez, I'm going to score, you know, high marks in this because I've already got a year of Latin. All these youngsters mm-hmm. that are just, and they don't know anything. Mm-hmm. And much to my amazement, my classmates, you know, during the, uh, when we got the exams back, scored higher than I did. And here I was repeating what they were learning for the first time. I, I marveled at, you know, I started thinking I must be pretty dumb or stupid because I, you know, I've, I'm doing this a second time, but I can't score as high as these people are scoring. And it was only much later in life that I realized, oh, my goodness, uh, these people, a lot of them were uh, Italians, perhaps French. And so for them, uh, Latin was a natural. There was no problem. You know, it's just like uh, almost like Italian. Mm. So no wonder they were scoring high and no wonder I wasn't doing well. But it impressed me that, gee, I'm not maybe as smart as, as these people that I'm going to school with. And it took me a long time to sort of emerge with the confidence that I needed to get through school and then university and ultimately into the professions. Mm. Uh, but what it did is it cultivated in me my own self, you know, self-help that I, if I'm going to get somewhere, it's going to be because I, I have to do it. Nobody's going to help me kind of a view of perhaps too much. So, you know, it's not maybe necessarily the best of you, you know, if you've got good parents who are willing to help you through your education, then that's a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. In my in my case, my parents didn't speak English very well, so they couldn't help me very much. Mm-hmm. And I soon realized in, in, in doing my homework that uh, they were a hindrance rather than a help for me. And I said, okay, go away. I'll do this by myself. Mm-hmm. That's a kind of a little bit of an insight into what cultivated me to be sort of what I am and who I am today. That's interesting how your experience with Latin and how your parents who had just moved to a new country from Ukraine wanted to help their son with study, but... Uh, it's not that they didn't know the, you know, the mathematics or, you know, the sciences, etc. They did, but, but, you know, in the language, language yeah. and that's why they couldn't help. Yeah. The barrier was the language. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about your professional life. Okay. Let's, you have expertise in both U.S. and Canadian immigration law. Yes. On, on the Billion Insight podcast, we often break complex topics into easily digestible insights. Ensuring our content is accessible and inclusive for all the listeners, regardless of their background or expertise. So, okay. so before we dive deeper into your profession, I, I would like to ask some fundamental question about the law. Mm-hmm. So can you start by explaining to us what is immigration law? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying I, I work with Pace Law Firm in Toronto, which is a U.S. and Canadian immigration law firm. 
it actually helps people, especially investor immigrants all over the world. But we mm. focus on Canada and the U.S. Immigration to Canada or the U.S. Paces, L P A C E law firm. Uh, and by the way, that you can find more about my law firm at PaceLawFirm.com if anybody's interested. By the way, I will link all the links you can uh, find in the description. So yeah, please That'll continue. So what is immigration law? Well, that's the those are the rules that govern the migration of people from elsewhere to the country. Like for example, Canadian immigration law. That those are the rules that govern how people and when people and who can immigrate from outside of Canada into Canada or outside the U.S. into the United States. And briefly, it has to do with the migration of people. Hmm. Yep, yep. So I'm trying to understand the immigration process a little deeper. I have two questions here. Yeah. For, first, what are the most common challenges people encounter during the immigration process? And the second is, what the role do immigration lawyers play in the process? Okay. Uh, well, uh, the most common problems uh, immigration immigrants have are to know how to do it. They know what they want, but they don't know how to do it. Know-how is what's missing, and that's what immigrate, immigration lawyers provide, is the know-how. Not everybody who's an immigrant understands that there is such a thing as immigration lawyers that do this. Like if you have a sore tooth, you know that you should go to a dentist. A dentist can help you. If you have a sore knee, you know you should go to a doctor. A doctor can help you. Mm -hmm. But not all people understand that there is a category of lawyers that deal with immigration, such as me, mm -hmm. immigration attorneys or lawyers that help people immigrate to Canada, the US or elsewhere. You guys have basically navigated those people to solve this complexity during the immigration yeah. process, right? Yeah, so let me draw an analogy. Suppose I know that I want to fly from Toronto to Los Angeles. Hmm. I can do it one of two ways. One way is I buy a ticket and go on an airplane and fly to Los Angeles. Hmm. Another possible way is I could buy an airplane buy a manual on how to fly an airplane, sit down in the cockpit, open the manual at page one, and study the manual and learn how to fly and ultimately fly the airplane and fly to Los Angeles. Both ways accomplish my goal. Just as an immigrant who wants to immigrate, let's say, to the United States, can accomplish the goal by trying to do it him or herself or they can hire someone like me, in other words, buy a ticket, mm. which pays for their travel to, or in my case, pays for my work to get them the status they want in the United States or Canada. Either way works, but probably the easier way is to pay someone like me to do the work rather than to do it themselves. So, sir, let's understand the mindset of the people who wants to settle down in a new country. So what are the some common reasons people immigrate besides seeking a better life? Okay, well, some of the common reasons are they're trying to escape poverty or discrimination mm -hmm. or racism or war or, uh, you know, climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, or they are displaced or, uh, you know, uh, unsettled and need a new place to live. Or there's, they're trying to, the most common in our case, usually, is that uh, the immigrant wants to create a better life for their children, hmm. such as, I want my kids to go to an Ivy League school, such as Harvard, Yale, or Columbia in the United States, or University of Toronto, or McGill in Canada. Hmm. Other reasons are, I got married to someone from Canada or the US, and I want to move there. Mm. Or I want to make a lot of money and I don't think I can make it where I am. So I'm going to go to the United States and make some money. I'm going to move to, for example, Florida. And uh, and uh, I see it as the land of milk and honey. And uh, if I go there and get into business, I'm going to make a lot of money and become rich. Mm. These are some of the motivations people have for moving. Mm. Can you discuss the impact of immigration on both the host country and the immigrants themselves? 
Well, from the point of view of the host country, not everybody is welcome. Mm. There are, for example, over 100 million people who are displaced today and have no home. Over 100 million that are wandering around in the world, probably mostly in refugee camps and so on. Mm. Some refugee camps have over a million people in them. They all want a place to live, but not every country wants to have them come and be immigrants. Mm. The host countries, the countries like Canada, the United States, Australia, even Western Europe, etc., Argentina, mm -hmm. they control who comes. It's their job to decide who can come and why these people can come and who cannot come. Because no country in the world can absorb 100 million immigrants, no matter how generous and compassionate it may be, it will just be overwhelmed. It's impossible. So they have rules and they impose rules on immigrants, migrants, saying, if you want to come follow these rules, you know, and the kind of rules, the kind of things they want are skilled uh, immigrants, hmm. immigrants with family members who can support them and help them in their journey to come. Uh, they want immigrants who want to study and improve themselves and make something out of their lives and in the process contribute to the life of the host society. Mm. They want, uh, you know, uh, investors who can invest money and create jobs and uh, build industries. They want students who are studying to become professionals or, you know, uh, tradespeople, uh, skilled people who can contribute to the economy. What they don't want are laggards, criminals, people who are sick and uh, want to come to be cured in the healthcare systems uh, where the countries have, you know, have healthcare provided. And, um, you know, just generally people of bad moral character, for example, those are the kind of people they don't want. So the immigrants, their benefit is when they come, they live in a better society. They have better opportunities. That they have schools for kids to go to. They have jobs to work in and to make money. They have a future that they can look forward to. Mm. There's more room for them. You know, there's more air to breathe. There's a freedom that they uh, enjoy. That perhaps they don't. They don't have back home. Those are some of the characteristics that motivate people and, mm. and impact people in, in, the, in the immigrant experience. Mm. So you mentioned that no country in the world can observe millions of immigrants. So people often want to come illegally into that country. So what do you think? How significant is illegal immigration today? Well, it's very significant, uh, especially in the United States on the southern border. It's the number one issue in the U.S. election at this moment. It's very significant in Canada as well because of, uh, you know, people coming in either illegally across the border. There's a place called Roxham Road, which is a border between New York and Quebec on the Canada-U.S. border, where people were filtering through without approvals mm. that were a big a source of concern for Canada. Mm. Uh, but most of the most significant source of illegal or undocumented immigrants is uh, people who come on a visit like a visitor's visa or a visa of some sort and then overstay the period of authorized stay and uh, stay longer and decide to stay even permanently. Mm. So again, you know, these countries like the United States, Canada and Europe and so on, the absorbing countries are faced with a moral dilemma, which is they cannot help everyone. They just simply cannot. So the question is, what are, the, what are the fairest rules that they can implement to make it possible for those who want to come to come mm -hmm. legally, according to the law, but to block those who cannot come or should not come mm -hmm. uh, and not have them trying to come into the country illegally or without papers? And because the borders are so, you know, long and uh, like the U.S.-Mexican border is thousands of miles long, it's hard to police the borders to block out migrants who, you know, are desperate to come and are prepared to take any measure necessary to get into the country. 
Mm. So, you know, the, the countries have to do the best they can. And there are international commitments that they make. For example, refugees, people who are fleeing their country of origin uh, because they have a well-founded fear of persecution if they stay based on accepted grounds such as race, religion, political opinion, mm -hmm. uh, social origin, you know, uh, gender, things of this nature. Uh, these fleers, these people who are seeking refuge from this fear of persecution, mm -hmm. uh, there are international commitments that these countries have made to ensure that these people are afforded an opportunity to claim asylum or refugee status and enter the country. So mm -hmm. those, that's an area where, uh, you know, uh, they're trying to do their best in terms of, uh, uh, you know, hearing claims made and uh, testing their uh, legitimacy. And if they are legitimate, allowing these people to enter the country. But it, uh, it's a challenge. This is an international challenge. It's not easy to solve these issues. Hmm. I do remember when Trump became the president for the first time. Right. Yeah, he, uh, I mean, promised that he will build a big wall between Mexico and the U.S. in right. order to dodge the immigration. So, so what's your thought on it? Was it a good idea or is it completely illogical to build a wall to dodge the Ill illegal immigration? Well, initially, I thought it was ridiculous, hmm. and uh, and particularly uh, when Trump asserted that Mexico will pay for it, which they haven't, obviously. Uh, but I see that in some instances, even the Democrats have uh, conceded that in some areas maybe a wall is a good idea. Uh, for example, the uh, the senator from Arizona, I forget his name, but uh, he's married to the Gifford woman that got shot. And he's a likely possibility for vice president uh, with uh, Kamala Harris. Oh, um, uh, when he's an astronaut, he uh, he has argued that there are certain areas where a wall probably makes sense. But by and large, the problem of I illegal immigration is not going to be solved with a wall, because you can climb over a wall. All you need is a ladder. You can dig under a wall, all you need is a shovel. You can go around a wall, all you need to do is get to the end of the wall and turn, go around. Or you can catapult yourself over the wall, say, for example, take an ultralight airplane plane and fly over. Yep. You know, there are ways of getting around. Or you can drill through a wall, you know, or tunnel yep. through under a wall. Yep. So because there's a wall there, it doesn't mean it's going to solve anything, except it's going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. But, you know, the, the challenge is, make people abide by the law by making rules that are reasonable and easy to relatively easy it's not going to be easy but relatively achievable ways of channeling people into the country and punish those who do not abide by the rules yeah. and try to self-help and self-select themselves to enter the country uh, and, and eliminate the reasons why people are coming. And the number one reason why people are coming yeah. is the discrepancy, the disparity between what a person can earn in the United States and what a person can earn wherever they're coming from. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know, what, you know, Latin America, wherever, it, where, you know, some of the poor countries in Latin America. Like mm -hmm. economic. Uh, incentives for coming to the United States are very strong. Like mm. when you can make dollars an hour in the United States, mm. but if you live uh, somewhere in Honduras, you know, Salvador, you could make two dollars an hour if you're lucky. Mm. It's natural for people to want to move northbound, and America and other countries, the rich countries, have to increase and well, they have to support the poor countries economically to narrow the gap between what can be earned in America and what can be earned elsewhere. Because otherwise, there's a powerful magnet for people to go northbound in the case of uh, Latin America, for example. You know, I have many listeners from various African and the Middle East countries. As a podcaster, I often engage with people from these countries and have the privilege of hosting guests from there. Right. 
we talk about their country cultures and challenges so usually the most common thing they share with me is that they want to live their country for a better life you you have mentioned earlier that many countries welcome individuals who face religious persecution or similar issues in their home country but what about those who don't face such challenges what are the other requirements for someone to become a citizen of a developed country like us well we we happen to uh, you know have a lot of clients from africa and also from the middle east the clients that are most attractive or able to find ways to come to the united states or canada for example from nigeria we have a large community of people from nigeria that have uh, worked with us to immigrate um, to the united states and also to canada or you know from egypt for example we we help a lot of egyptians and other people from the middle east mm-hmm. so again we're back to if you imagine a large circle just uh, imagine in your mind a large circle you know mm-hmm. drawing a big circle on a piece of paper that's the world of people who want to immigrate let's say to the united states or canada that we handle the caribbean countries for investor immigrants and europe investor immigrants to europe for example mm-hmm. uh, but let's talk about let's say north america mm-hmm. if that circle represents all the immigrants who want to come mm-hmm. if you draw a smaller circle inside that larger circle that's the kind of community that we can help and want to help those are people who are educated meaning they finished university skilled meaning they have some kind of skill such as it could be a trade but more likely a profession so for example engineer architect uh, lawyer doctor teacher whatever professor those kind of people people who are business people who have started businesses and want to come that's it you know if i were to identify the best way for someone who wants to come to canada or the united states mm-hmm. who's in the business world the best way is if they have a business where they are and they want to start up a new subsidiary business in the united states or in canada Mm-hmm. that way it's called that intercorporate transfer visa work visa is the way to start and ultimately the way to gain permanent residence in Canada for the business person mm-hmm. and for that business person's entire immediate family spouse and children all of them can come to the United States on what's called an L1 visa intercorporate transfer or to Canada intercorporate transfer mm-hmm. and to serve as a model about what i'm talking about imagine let's say someone in japan mm-hmm. who's a manager at a toyota car plant mm-hmm. and has been a manager for at least one year of the last three years of that plant mm-hmm. imagine that person being transferred let's say to new york to become a manager of a toyota plant in the united states that is a classic intercorporate transfer that would enable that manager and that manager's family including children to come to the united states usually on a work visa and usually it would be started for 3 years and then renewed for another up to 7 years in the united states and similarly in canada mm. through the intercorporate transfer now in the case of investors from the middle east or africa or indeed even from india i know there are more millionaires in india than in the united states i believe and you know, there's a lot of people with wealth there if they have a business in india that employs let's say more i would say you know to be realistic let's say at least 10 people Mm. and this been in existence for let's say at least 5 years mm. and paid taxes and whatever is necessary back mm. home and they want to start a new business not like the example i gave uh, for japan but a new business so a manager mm. uh, and owner of a business wants to start a new business in let's say new york or in toronto or wherever mm. they can start a new business we could help them by incorporating a company preparing a business plan 
possibly buying a business, for example, a hotel, mm. for example, Hilton Hotel or mm. Best Western Hotel. Mm. And by doing that, they can transfer themselves and their family from, let's say, India or from, let's say, Nigeria or let's mm. say from Egypt mm. to Toronto or New York to live and work in those countries to start mm. and then later get a green card and then in the United States or Maple Leaf card, permanent residence in Canada, mm -hmm. and then get citizenship in the United States or Canada. That would be the most classic and easiest way for people to come mm -hmm. uh, from abroad to these countries. These are some of the ways they could win. Mm, that's interesting, but, but they have to be rich. <laughs> So, so you mentioned that earlier they will get that a three two year visa work visa then it will be renewed up to seven years then eventually right. they will get the green card and get the citizenship of that country right 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 that's the way it works so how long they have to stay in let's say in Canada or US in order to get the green card and before that could you explain what green card is to to our listener for those who don't know what green card is yes a green card is evidence that the person has gained permission to stay in the country, America, hmm. permanently. In other words, they've qualified through immigration to come to the United States permanently to live and work and study or do whatever they want in the United States permanently. Hmm. That's what a green card is. In Canada, it's called the Maple Leaf card. So, yeah. so basically, the green card is the same as the citizenship, right? No. A citizenship is the right to vote and live in the United States permanently or Canada permanently. Hmm. Uh, the right to, uh, for example, take jobs in uh, government, to run in elections, to uh, uh, occupy positions of national safety, security, join the Army, Navy, Air Force, etc., and live and travel abroad with a passport of the country that they got the citizenship from. Mm. So the green card is only allow you to stay in that country for, I mean, longer duration of time. But the citizenship is the ultimate that you can do whatever the thing you can join in defense or whichever That's you like, right. you can vote. Yeah. You can, uh, for example, for the United States, citizenship uh, requires that you live in the U.S with a green card for five years, generally, mm. and that you've been physically present in the United States for at least two and a half out of those five years. Mm. Uh, and Canada requires uh, live a life in Canada for three years, and that you've been physically present in Canada for three years to get mm. citizenship. Mm. So either way, you can become a citizen, and in the case of many countries, you could be a dual citizen. That is to say, for example, Canadians and Americans can be dual citizens. So if I move to the United States as a Canadian, I can become citizen of the United States and I can be an American and a Canadian forever. And my parent, my, I'll be, as a parent, I can pass down my citizenship to my children. Hmm. See, permanent residents are unable to pass down their, their legal status to, to their kids. Mm. Uh, once the permanent resident, you know, dies, that's the end of permanent residence. There's no, there's no next generation in uh, mm -hmm. in permanent in, residence. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you have the citizenship of both Canada and U.S. So that technically you can vote for the PM for Canada and President for United States, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's interesting. So you have experience working with the United Nations. Can you share with yes. us? your experience working with UN? Sure. I was in the UN for three years. I was working as a journalist. Uh, I, I was writing for a couple of newspapers. Uh, one, uh, one chain I was working with was called, uh, it was a Canadian chain, and, and it had a number of, of newspapers that you know were published, for example, in Winnipeg and Edmonton and Toronto, et cetera. Um, and I'm just trying to remember the name just because it's been quite a while since I was over there. But anyway, I wrote for them and I wrote for an American newspaper called Svoboda. And uh, I had a, 
a pass, a journalist pass, a UN credential to be able to attend the United Nations daily. They have a daily news briefing at the UN, uh, where the, the group I worked for, by the way, is the Southern Newspaper Chain, hmm. uh, the Canadian Southern Newspaper Chain was the name of the organization. But anyway, hmm. um, this was in the 1970s. So every day I'd attend uh, newspaper uh, news briefings, and uh, the most prominent people of the day going through New York at the UN would uh, come down to the newspaper, to the uh, press circle there and uh, hold uh, conference, news conferences, and we could ask them any questions we wanted. Uh, usually they had something they wanted to announce. So for example, I was there and asked questions of uh, President Carter, President Ford, uh, Kurt Waldheim, uh, Henry Kissinger, Idi Amin, such leaders. I didn't ask all of them, but I was present uh, when these kind of people were there. And, uh, you know, I wrote about uh, immigration and human rights issues, and also about the issues of the day, the law of the sea, and uh, human settlements, habitat, and also about uh, the International Women's Year. Those were the subjects that I dealt with at the time when I was there. Hmm. So, sir, since you work with the UN, I assume you have visited the UN headquarters. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I go there from time to time. Uh, you know, I've been through the whole building and everything. So what was the UN headquarters like when you were working there? I mean, the atmosphere. Well, at the moment, the problem is, uh, you know, from my point of view, Russia's in there as one of the, uh, you know, big five or whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, veto members mm -hmm. on the Security Council. Uh, the problem is, you know, it's an aggressor in a war. It, it shouldn't be in that. And it has no right of dissent from the former Soviet Union mm -hmm. to take over the seat of uh, the Security Council as mm -hmm. Russia now. It's not the Soviet Union, it's Russia. Mm -hmm. It's a new country. And so there was no formal, uh, you know, the, the uh, what's the word for it? The uh, formality, the legal formalities of assumption of power there were not followed. I mean, it's just one day they took over and now they're on the Security Council. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, not a great place. It's a great place for meeting people, for diplomats and leaders to meet. Mm -hmm. That's the one great thing that it serves. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's not functioning very well in terms of uh, you know, following its mandate and, and, the, and the charter. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of exceptions to what the charter requires that, that are going on. The mm -hmm. provenance of, of, you know, their, their rise to power in the, Russia's rise to power in the, in the United Nations mm -hmm. is uh, challengeable. India belongs in the, in, the, in the Security Council. Yeah, that's the biggest irony of the world. India being the largest democracy in the world still doesn't have a permanent seat on the UNSC. It is, indeed it is, you know, but yeah. uh, it's, it's something to work for. A new generation's yeah. got to come along and, and fix that. So, sir, you have mentioned that you have met Mother Teresa when she visited Vancouver. So, could you share this experience with us? Sure. I was at the UN Habitat Conference in Vancouver at the University mm -hmm. of British Columbia in 19, I think it was 1976, roughly. And as I was crossing the university area, going to a building where we're going to meet. I looked across and uh, I was uh, walking with a friend of mine named Yorama Kovalchuk. Hmm. And uh, across on the other side of the uh, walking area, there was a, a, an elderly nun walking. And he, he looked over and he said to me, look, that's Mother Teresa. And I said, Mother Teresa, who's that? Hmm. And he said, well, she's as close to a saint as you'll ever meet on this earth. Hmm. And I said, oh. And we ended up going to the same place, which was the United Nations Conference. Oh. Uh, they had a conference session, and she was there as well as I. I was there as a journalist at the UN, and my interest was in raising questions pertaining to dissidents in the Soviet Union and their, uh, you know, their mistreatment. She was there because she had an interest in uh, looking after the uh, poor people that she was trying to look after in India. Mm in Calcutta, I guess. And as we 
sat at the conference and took part in the, in the discussion, every so often Mother Teresa would uh, raise her hand and be recognized by the chairperson. And she would talk and raise issues about, you know, orphans or about uh, people who were poor and the need for shelter, etc. And and uh, and uh, so she would, uh, her involvement tended to interrupt the flow of the discussion over time. And the reason it interrupted was because the chairperson deferred to her whenever she wanted to speak. Hmm. Uh, so she was given more than an ample opportunity to speak compared to others who were trying to raise their relevant concerns. Hmm. And in my case, uh, I have to confess, I was getting irritated that, you know, she was derailing the discussion hmm. to some extent. I recognized, you know, in uh, hearing what she had to say, the value of what she was saying, but I was disconcerted about the degree of deference that the chair was offering her. But nonetheless, the discussion went on and finally we finished and everybody had their say. Mm -hmm. And then we were leaving. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, looking at her and I'm thinking, you know, she was an irritant in the discussion. She looks like just an old, uh, you know, sister, uh, uh, nothing special. Uh, the costume was, a, she had a white and blue yep. uh, costume. Well, that was a little bit different, but. I said, like, what is it about this lady that's so spectacular? Well, why would she, you know, why would people think she's a saint? I mean, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. So I watched her as I was going back out through the same plaza area where we were entering and when I first saw her, mm -hmm. I watched her carefully as she walked out. And as she's walking out, and sort of, I was observing from a distance, mm -hmm. I saw her stop and a lady with a small child came up to her. And I watched carefully as they talked. And then I saw what I think was the characteristic that made her the saint that she was. She took that baby into her hands and held it in a way that you could just feel the love that she was showing that child. And I realized it was in her touch. It was her touch that was saintly, mm -hmm. sacred in my opinion. And I I, I was moved by it. Mm. And then it was only a short few minutes. And then she gave the baby back to the mother and she went on her way and I went on my way. But I remember that moment to this day because of her touch. Mm. That's interesting. She's known not for her words, not for her speech, but for her actions. Yes. Yeah. She... Uh, I think you probably, you'll know this better than I do because you're Indian, but her big thing was nobody should die alone. There should always be someone next to you when you're dying, no matter how poor and wretched you are. There should be someone. And she served that purpose. She was the person that comforted those who were poor and yeah. sick and had no money on yeah. their lap, you know, with their last breath. She would be there holding them. Yeah. And that, that's what that's that's why she's a saint. I mean, no wonder that she won the Nobel Peace. Oh yeah, yeah. If anybody deserved it, she did. Yeah. Uh, since we are talking about the Nobel Peace Prize, I just remember a funny thing that Mahatma Gandhi didn't get the Nobel Peace Prize. This is the biggest irony in the Nobel history. I can understand this is because the British made sure he wouldn't get the Nobel Prize. He didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. But then. We all revere him anyway. Yeah, Mahatma Gandhi didn't need a Nobel Prize. He is the prize himself. I mean, there is a prize named after him. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So being an immigration lawyer, what sparked your interest in human rights issues? I mean, you oh, writing for the human rights issue? The involved in that was uh, after I graduated and, and became a lawyer, I was approached by the, the Ukrainian World Congress, the World Congress of Free Ukrainians, it was called back then. Hmm. When it was part of the USSR. Right, yes, yes, yeah. you've got that right. Yeah. So I was asked if I could go to the UN for them and get accreditation for them as a non-government organization hmm. with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. So that's what I worked on also. 
And that's what led me into this job of getting the press credential, afforded me access to the United Nations. I became a member of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Uh, but my connection to the World Congress uh, got me into a bit of trouble because the Soviet Union was unhappy about my being there. Mm-hmm. And they complained to the uh, secretariat about my uh, being present at the United Nations. And indeed, I spent a couple of years talking with the administration at the United Nations, explaining who are these Ukrainians Mm-hmm. And that is to say the Ukrainians outside of the Soviet Union, and what do they want, and why do they want to get accredited, and you know, like, what am I doing? Why am I a journalist there? And what you know, what, what do I write? Who am I writing for? And all this kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. so I was under fire for a while there, and uh, uh, you know, uh, I had a battle on my hands because uh, the UN Correspondents Association was helpful and supportive of my presence. Hmm. But the Soviet Union was not helpful and not supportive uh, because they didn't want the Ukrainian stirring up the pot at the United Nations, mm-hmm. which they regarded as their sort of fiefdom or mm-hmm. kingdom mm-hmm. because they were on the Security Council and they had the, the, the veto. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. I spent three years embattled as a journalist at the United Nations. And then after three years, I left that post and moved on. Yeah, yeah, but just like the China is doing with the Taiwan, they don't want Taiwan to be acknowledged or recognized by the United Nations. That's very perceptive of you to say that. Yes, that's exactly the same parallel. Yeah. And we, the two countries involved, I, I say we now as a Ukrainian, you know, Ukrainian background, mm-hmm. we have the same issues in, in parallel issues even today. Today, there's a war going on in Ukraine. Russia attempted to invade Ukraine because they've taken the view that the Ukraine doesn't exist and there is no such thing as Ukrainian culture uh, or a nation. It's all really just Russians, uh, mm-hmm. sort of, uh, uh, what's the word? Wayward Russians is the way perhaps you might describe their view of Ukrainians. Mm-hmm. And so there's this invasion that's going on for the last almost three years coming up. Mm-hmm. But the war has been going on between Ukraine and Russia for 10 years now. Mm-hmm. We're in the 10th year of the war on the eastern side of Ukraine, but the third year of the full invasion of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And in the case of China, we have the same scenario going. China is eyeing Taiwan, mm-hmm. which they think is part of China. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, they're just uh, probably watching what's going on with Putin and his invasion of Ukraine to decide, should they take a step like invading Taiwan? Mm-hmm. Or is that too dangerous or is that too complicated for them because mm-hmm. of the uh, because of the support that, uh, well, the first, the, the fighting Ukraine has raised. And, and it's a simple, uh, just to present it as a very simple problem, this current problem. Mm-hmm. Imagine you live in a house. And some one day guy comes in, breaks through the door, comes in and says, I'm going to be living here from now on. This is my house. Mm-hmm. They say, wait, this is my house. This is where I live. Say, no, no, this isn't your house. This is my house. This mm-hmm. is essentially what happened in Ukraine with mm-hmm. uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And uh, Taiwan is uh, in a very, very similar situation where, you know, they're vulnerable. Now, lucky, luckily for Ukraine, mm-hmm. uh, They've had the support of the West, but I might mention that India does not support Ukraine. And oh. one of the big frustrations is that India is doing business with Russia and ignoring the sanctions and the efforts uh, that have been placed on Russia because of the invasion. And so there's, you know, there's some disappointment with India's uh, current position. And then why aren't they supporting uh, Ukraine? Uh, okay, okay. It's, it's a very sensitive issue. First of all, I would like to say, as far as my understanding, where my country's position uh, is in this situation of the war, people are talking about this, like how India doesn't support Ukraine, how come India's PM visited Russia during this war, which implies that India is supporting Russia, not the Ukraine. I mean, this is not true because our prime minister will visit Ukraine shortly and he will meet Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, and is likely to ask Putin to seize the war. So India's position is completely neutral, be it today or the past. Our country never support any any kind of violence. India never endured any kind of war, you know. 
So as our Prime Minister said when he met Putin that this is not the era of war. Be it in Ukraine or Gaza, India never ever support any kind of war. You mentioned that India is doing business with Russia. Yeah, it is true, India buys Russian oil. But the irony of, of the West, I mean, the irony of this sentence is India buys the Russian oil despite uh, what is happening with uh, Ukraine, what Russia is doing with the Ukraine. I would like to say, as, uh, as rightly said by our foreign minister, S.J. Sankar, that whatever Russian oil India buys in a month post the war, Europe buys that amount of Russian oil in just the afternoon. I noticed you refer to oil purchases. Uh, if you are looking at energy purchases from Russia, I would suggest that your attention should be focused on Europe, which probably uh, we do buy some uh, uh, energy which is necessary for our energy security. But I suspect looking at the figures, probably uh, our total purchases for the month would be less than what Europe does in an afternoon. So you might want to think about it. So I can, know, I, well, like I, I'm not hostile to Indians because of well, what I'm, I'm just giving the general perspective. I see, yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're talking about. Uh, this is to say sort of like, well, um, uh, sort of uh, a, a stupid analogy would be to say, I'm stealing cars because everybody else is stealing cars. Or, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of other people stealing cars. Well, yes, that's true. But that doesn't make, uh, that's not an excuse for why you, why are you doing it? It's sort uh, of, now, now, from an Indian point of view, it's understandable because they need the oil. And India's, you know, the economic needs are strong. But from the uh, Ukrainian point of view, which is a life and death struggle, in, I, mean, they're, they're... I just want to I just want to say something to hear is sure. We Indians, we never forget, especially when someone helps us during our tough times. We remember when Pakistan attacked India multiple times, especially in 1972. No major country came forward to help India, except the USSR. In fact, many Western countries, including the US, supported Pakistan and were against India in our tough times. So the biggest irony is that, as our foreign minister rightly said, I would like to quote him again, Europe's problem is the world's problem. But when it comes to India, it's only India's problem. You know, somewhere Europe has to grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems. But the world's problems are not Europe's problems. That it's, if it is you, it's yours. If it is me, it's ours. I think that's something, uh, and I see, you know, reflections of that. So coming to the war, I would like to say that it's very difficult to see the war. I mean, it's not a matter of black and white, where one side is completely right and other side is completely wrong. As a podcaster, I often talk to many people from different countries, including Russia and Ukraine. When I ask Russian people about the current mindset inside Russia towards the war, what they think about the war and Ukraine, the common response I got from them is that they totally see this is a proxy war between US and Russia, not that like uh, Ukraine and Russia. What they say to me is like, they think that if it is, wasn't for NATO, Russia wouldn't have invaded Ukraine at all. In fact, I managed to have a guest from Russia and we discussed this in an episode. So you can check that episode. I shall put the link in the description. Let, let, me, just, uh, let me just say this. Uh... I, um, I I agree that, you know, it's a good idea to discuss things like this. The arguments he's put forward are preposterous for these reasons. Uh, number one is NATO is bordering on Russia right now without Ukraine. There are, there are NATO countries bordering with Russia right now. So, you know, why Ukraine would be different than any other country? And the only reason Ukraine wants to join NATO is because Russia's invading Ukraine. Mm. And just to add a little more insight for you. Mm -hmm. um, in 1994, after the Soviet Union fell apart, Ukraine became the world's third largest possessor of nuclear arms. Yeah. Thousands of them. 
both tactical and strategic nuclear arms. And there was some concern by Russia and the United States and the UK, etc., about mm. Ukraine having nuclear weapons. So they met in Budapest mm. and they reached an agreement. And the agreement was that Ukraine would surrender, surrender its nuclear weapons to mm. Russia in exchange for a guarantee that Russia would not invade, but respect Ukrainian sovereignty and independence. Mm -hmm. And that guarantee was signed by the United States, UK, France, and China, as well as Russia. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, Russia has not complied with that guarantee and went ahead and invaded Ukraine. Yeah. So it's not surprising that Ukraine wants to be part of NATO, as did Finland and Sweden, not because the United States or anybody else is pushing them to join NATO, mm -hmm. but because their security and independence and sovereignty is being threatened by the Russian, you know, by Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, you know, as far as... Uh, Ukraine is not fighting this war. Ukraine is defending itself. It's not attacking Russia. There's no attack on Russia. The attack is on Ukraine. The war would end if the Russian soldiers would leave Ukraine today. There'd be no threat to the United to Russia today if the soldiers just left Ukraine. But the, <laughs> that's not what they're trying to do. Anyway, that's a pretty long yeah. discussion. Yeah, yeah. And there's we can we can do a total totally separate uh, episode. We only talk, we'll talk about this conflict. Sure. Yeah. Since we are talking about Ukraine, and since you are from Ukrainian heritage, while researching for this podcast, I came to know that your aunt was a famous Ukrainian opera singer, Solomia Kruselnitsky. I hope I pronounced her name properly. It's a Krushelnitsky. Krushelnitsky. Yeah. So Solomia Krushelnitsky, which is, uh, whom your latest book is based on. So can you tell, tell us about your latest book? Sure, I'll tell you very briefly. First of all, it's an audio book as well as a hard book uh, and also Kindle. It's available through Amazon or uh, it's also available on books on uh, your Apple phone. If you use an Apple phone, the book uh, site. It's called Solomia, that's her first name, S-O-L-O-M-E-A, Solomia, hmm. star of opera's golden age. Hmm. Now, I know that many people may not be very involved with opera or, you know, may not know much about music history hmm. and may never have heard this name before. Uh, but that's uh, a reason why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. And I would like to speak directly to those people who may not have an interest directly in opera or a great interest in opera and why they may be interested in reading this book. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the book is not about necessarily opera or even just about this particular lady, Solomia, who was my great aunt, meaning my grandmother's sister. Mm -hmm. It's a book about human achievement about reaching the very top of your field, whatever field it is. In this case, it was in the field of opera for Salomia. Mm. And by reaching the top, the very top, I mean that Salomia was the world's most prominent uh, soprano in the first decade, or at least one of the most prominent so uh, sopranos in the mm. first decade of the 1900s, traveling worldwide singing in opera theaters in, in Europe, in North Africa, in South America, in North America. Mm -hmm. uh, now, she didn't get out east. She didn't get to India, unfortunately. But it, she did star in a opera that involved Japan. And uh, this year happens to be the 120th anniversary of the mm -hmm. opera Madame Butterfly. And for those who are involved in opera, this year is the 120th anniversary of the success of the opera, Madame Butterfly. And I, if you'll allow me, I'd like to tell you a little story. 
about yeah, please. that opera. Please, that, please. That would be okay. So it's an opera about a geisha girl named Chio Chio San, uh, who lived in Nagasaki in Japan. And she lived there in the 1800s at a time when Japan was being opened up to the world. When, America, when the American Navy came to Japan, yeah. uh, and there was a guy named Pinkerton, who was a naval officer in the American Navy, who met this Chio Chio son, and they had a relationship, and even actually went through a kind of a wedding ceremony, and ended up sleeping together, uh, only to announce uh, that, uh, only to later have Pinkerton announce to Chio Chio son that he's been called back to the United States and he's going to have to leave. And they agree that he will go, but he promises Chio Chio san that he will return to her. Mm. And she waits faithfully for him for several years, pregnant with him not knowing that she is going to have his child, his son. Mm. And she gives birth to the child and she waits for years, four or five years, for Pinkerton to return. And then one day, he does return. And when he returns, she's thrilled that she's back, but then realizes that he's returned with an American wife in tow. Oh. Uh, and thing comes, you know, what becomes a problem is what should this couple now do with the child, given yeah. that the child has a choice either to remain with Chio Chio's son, uh, who lives a life as a geisha girl, or to be surrendered to the care of the father, Pinkerton, to return to the United States with him mm. and live with him and his new bride. And so Chio Chio son agrees to surrender the, wife, the, the boy to Pinkerton to let him go to America. And in one of the final scenes in the opera, Chio Chio son takes the child off to the side and she says this, these words to the child. She mm. says, Pointing at her face, she says, look at this face. It is the face of your mother. Remember it. Mm. You will never see it again. And mm. then the child goes off with Pinkerton to America. And the mother commits suicide. Mary Carey suicide. Oh, and that's man. how the opera ends. Now, this opera, the mm. story behind this opera, uh, uh, Madame Butterfly, mm is that there was indeed a, a geisha girl in Nagasaki. And uh, that story was written up by an American journalist who had gone there and came, came back to New York mm -hmm. and published in a magazine in New York. And a Brit, uh, English person, took a liking to that story and he created a play featuring Madam Butterfly, the story of Madam Butterfly. Yeah. And in uh, the early 1900s, Puccini, Como Puccini, who by then was quite a prominent composer of operas in Italy, yeah. uh, happened to be at this play and saw this story. And he fell in love with the story. And he went to the producer of the play and said, I must, I just simply must have the rights to this story so I can write an opera about it. And they agreed. And he came back to Milan and he wrote a score for the opera and arranged to, to, to uh, stage the opera at La Scala in Milan, which was the world's leading opera theater back in 1904. And to play the leading roles, he asked a lady named Rosina Storchio, not Salomia Krushenetska, but Rosina Storchio <laughs> to play the lead role, and a guy named Zanatello to play the tenor Pinkerton, and other prominent, the best, or among the best singers at that time in opera. And they staged the opera. And uh, Puccini was so confident of his success of this opera that he invited, unlike in any other premieres, he invited his family to attend. And that night at La Scala in 1904, when they were staging this opera for the first time, there was a sense of doom 
among those who were involved in the cast. There was just this discomfort, including Puccini himself. They were all not feeling very confident. They were nervous. And indeed, when they performed the opera, it was it collapsed. It was whistled down. It was heckled. Uh, you know, it was uh, disrupted by people calling out in the middle of the songs to the point where when the opera concluded, uh, Puccini resolved to to stop the run with just the one performance. And the, the next day he was faced with uh, newspaper headlines, you know, Puccini bombs, the opera, Madame Butterfly, a disaster, and so on. And he was crushed. He didn't know what to do. Uh, and so he turned to a friend of his, a guy named uh, Arturo Toscanini, who was the world's, probably the world's best conductor at that time. Indeed, Toscanini later uh, traveled to the United States. He immigrated to the United States and became the NBC symphonies uh, conductor many years later, uh, up to the 50s and beyond. But back then in 1904, Toscanini was a director yeah. and, and uh, uh, Puccini, the composer of Madame Butterfly, went to see Toscanini and, and he said, uh, look, I'm just you know, just destroyed. My opera fell apart. I don't know what to do. You know, what should I do? And Toscanini, who knew the Lumia Krushinitska very well, they were good friends, they performed together in the past, mm -hmm. said, there's only one woman who can opera, who can save this opera. And that's Solomia Krushinitska. Go see her. And Puccini followed that advice. And he asked Solomia to play the lead role in a restaging of the opera. Hmm. Well, to ask Solomia to do something like that would be like today asking hmm. a famous film star, for hmm. example, in the West, Julia Roberts, hmm. to perform in a movie that had just collapsed starring Sandra Bullock. Uh, it would just be really a very risky proposition. And it was back then because Solomia was already at the top of her fame. Mm. But he agreed for the sake of friendship, mainly because she was close friends with both of those people. And so for the next several months, Solomia wore a Japanese uh, outfit to have her adapt to the role of Chio Chio san And that was because she was in her early 30s back then, and she had to play the role of a girl who was, uh, you know, in her late teens. And so they worked hard, they restaged the opera, they you know, rewrote the, uh, the uh, score and everything. Mm -hmm. And indeed, they performed it at the Teatro Grande in um, a place called Brescia, which is just uh, about 60 miles away from Milan in Italy, to resounding success, to the point where the audience greeted the cast with seven standing ovations following the conclusion of the opera. And that opera went on to become one of the greatest operas in history. In fact, to this day, 130 years later, 120 years later, whatever it is, it's still one of the top you know, five operas uh, in the world. That's great. Uh, and the Lumia sang it 100 times across Europe. And after the hundredth performance, she gave the score back to Puccini and said, that's it, I'm not going to be singing this opera anymore. So that's the story of Madame Butterfly and uh, Selena Krushinitska's uh, role in rescuing that opera for world, uh, you know, uh, for the world legacy of the opera. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very interesting, I would say. For the listener, I have attached the book of uh, Mr. Randy, the Solomia star of the opera's gold, golden age. You can find the link in the description. That's terrific. So after your grand aunt, is there any other people from your family that who engaged in this medium, this uh, creative medium? Actually, uh, my daughter is doing a film about Solomia. It's, it's coming out in the next couple of months. It's called Solomia uncovering a family legacy and it will be out uh, in the film festivals shortly uh, but uh, her, uh, who's my aunt Natalka is her name natalie similar to you um 
there's nobody else. Well, the, the family was all musically inclined, like my, my, my aunt, not Solomia, mm. but my mother's sister mm. played the piano, but, uh, had completed studies of the piano. And, uh, you know, so there is some interest in, the, in music and in the artistic world uh, in the family as such. And I've been writing you know, so I guess that's my contribution. Yeah, okay. While researching about this podcast, when I came across your book, Solumia, Start of Opera's Golden Age, when I saw the book cover, I thought that I wish there would be a movie about her that would be a perfect tribute to her legacy of your late uh, grand aunt. But uh, to my surprise, you just mentioned that your daughter, in fact, is working on a, I mean, kind of yeah. a biopic of your aunt. That's that's terrific, I would say. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I, uh, it was uh, interesting. This book is a good book for, if you have a daughter or a granddaughter, or if you're a parent or a grandparent, and mm -hmm. you want a book about someone that uh, can be a role model for your children, mm -hmm. this is a good book for them, uh, for such people to buy. If you're in opera, this is a book you should read for sure. If mm -hmm. you're a historian, for example, you're interested, particularly in World War II, this book is all about, uh, you know, the actually primarily World War II, because uh, they survived uh, through World War II. My mother mm. and Solomia mm. both uh, lived together during World War II, as did my whole family. My grandmother, my grandfather, my aunt, so uh, my aunt Helen, and my mother all lived with Solomia in uh, what was under Poland at the time before the war broke out, and then became part of Nazi Germany after the Nazis invaded and then part of the Soviet Union thereafter. Mm -hmm. So a lot of history in this book. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, I know the Indians uh, uh, experienced the genocide. Um, uh, you know, Great Britain imposed the genocide on the, yep, on the yep, Indians. Yep. Yeah, the uh, Churchill. The Churchill imposed yeah. genocide in India, the Western yes. Churchill. Ukrainians also had a genocide in, in yeah. the 1930s uh, imposed by Stalin on Ukraine. And today in the war, there's a genocide going on in Ukraine again. So the Indian, uh, the Indian experience is is uh, close to ours in that regard, you know. And it was a colony, India, mm -hmm. and they had to uh, strive to get its independence. And through the good leadership that you had, Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. uh, God bless the soul, uh, you attained your independence, independence. Yep. sovereignty, you know, and uh, uh, the same is uh, happening now with uh, uh, Zelensky in Ukraine and, and uh, leadership there. So there are some some great uh, parallels yep. and com uh, commonalities. Yep. That's interesting. You mentioned Mahatma Gandhi. I don't know how this is related to the modern world. But Mahatma Gandhi's ideology was never about violence. He went on completely non-violence route. He never advocated for weapons or war. His philosophy was always, if someone slaps you one chick, instead of slapping him back, you should sue them your other chick. But you should not retaliate. Right. So if people can say that Gandhi's approach is passive, but it's actually a powerful form of protest. By choosing not to engage in violence, we can expose the cruelty and injustice of our opponents. So I yes, don't know it, how this can be achievable in this modern world, because this is very difficult path, you know, to go with the non-violence route. But there's, a, I, there's much to be said in favor of non-violence. I, uh, I had the good fortune of, of meeting Coretta King, the, the wife of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in New York at the United Nations, I, I had a chance to talk to her for about 20 yep. minutes, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. and Andrew Young, who was also one of the disciples of uh, Martin Luther King. And, uh, like, you know, I admire nonviolence as a, a means of achieving political goals. And, and uh, I, I I would advocate it. But I, I don't know if, like, like I said, if someone breaks into your house and says, look, it's not yeah. your house anymore. It's my yeah. house. I mean, same, uh, same thing, same thing happened to us also. I mean, for like thousand years, initially the Islamic people, they invaded India. 
then the uh, other country people like portuguese france also tried to invade in india then eventually the british british tried to invade in india they said that india is ours they they call it british india and that time they didn't call it india they call it a british india so just like your analogy some somebody broke into our house and claimed that it is it is there and for like 200 years more than 200 years they ruled india they looted india trillions of dollar but eventually we won against them it took us a great amount of time but ultimately we did it we kicked them out from our country you know i don't know if you're aware but uh, india had a uh, a legion or a a, a division in world exactly. war exactly there were people who who do not align their reason to the mahatma gandhi there were uh, people like netaji subhash chandra bose he is also as good as uh, mahatma gandhi you would say in terms of the impact to our country but he completely right. opposed to the mahatma gandhi his ideology was like uh, if you throw the pebbles at him he will throw bricks at you so completely opposite uh, non violence take gaza for example i'm not going to argue my your know, ukrainian background let's say yeah. gaza for example, you know yeah yeah uh, what do you do i i don't know you know like when people start shooting you and your children yeah like can you you know i i don't know to what extent at some stage i believe in self defense see i i part with with mahatma gandhi when I'm, like if someone's going to uh, uh, fire a nuclear missile on my country yeah i'm prepared to defend it I, i'm yeah. not prepared to turn my cheek at that level okay, uh, it is impossible so th- that's why yeah. i told you earlier that it is i mean i don't know whether it is relevant to this modern world where is uh, you can today we have a bombs like we can destroy the world in, in just a second right we can nuke yeah. the world and it will be in, in no time it will completely venice you know right yeah so i know. i agree with nonviolence in civilized societies for sure but i'm not sure about nonviolence <laughs> in uh like societies that aren't civil i don't know you know like that's far as i can take it i don't know what further i can but, say but 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 but, but, <laughs> but you said that a civilized society but if you read more about the indian history i mean what the british had did to us and that is no right. close to the i mean civilized they will know. not seem so civilized at all with <laughs> 100% on non violence and the british cause yeah like a Churchill, you know you, he's revered in 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 england and even out yeah. here and, but they yeah. people don't know about the genocide in india the concentration camps in south south africa yeah, yeah. that he was uh, there's i don't know like somehow i can be persuaded if to non-violence as a method i certainly would employ like i've never shot anybody i've never been in a fight uh, where i've had to uh, like uh, hit someone i i don't i'm not inviting anybody to hit me though but you know so I, i've lived a life of non-violence myself yeah, yeah. um and um one person i met i'll just share this one final story with you yeah uh one day in 1975 i was on an airplane flying from washington dc to new york city mm-hmm. and while i was in the airplane i picked up a time magazine and i read an article about a guy named danilo shomuk who at that time had already been in soviet concentration camps for 25 years mm-hmm. in, in prison for 25 years and i thought that's just depressing how can anybody be in prison for 25 years as a political prisoner so i decided at that time that i would join in the campaign to try and get him free he was in the soviet union in in, in prison and for the next 15 years i was involved in a campaign to try and get him released and finally he was released in 1987 after serving 40 years in soviet concentration camps when he had become amnesty internationals according to amnesty international the world's longest imprisoned prisoner of conscience mm. and it was my good fortune to actually meet this man when he was freed by the soviet union it was uh, uh, what's his name gorbachev was in power by then and allowed to leave and he came to canada where he had some family members and i met him in alberta and later i accompanied this man to the american bar association convention in san francisco where he was invited to speak 
And when we arrived in San Francisco and we entered the room, there was a panel discussion going on and the room had various political prisoner, former political prisoners from the Soviet Union in attendance who were also going to give evidence about their incarceration and about what the Soviet Union was doing in terms of human rights. Mm. And I recall when we entered the room that mm. Shumuk, as he entered the room, caused kind of a, a flurry in that these all these other dissidents rose to their feet just voluntarily all of a sudden they all rose to their feet as he entered the room out of respect for him mm-hmm. and he later you know spoke to the american bar association denouncing uh, a proposed agreement between the american lawyers and the soviet bar mm-hmm. uh, because it amounted to uh, providing the soviet bar with legitimacy uh, that it is not it did not deserve And I think in large measure, he was a person who kind of followed this Mahatma Gandhi philosophy, although he was initially a uh, underground fighter and uh, during the war fought with the Ukrainian partisan army against Hitler and Stalin, but was eventually captured by the Soviet Union and, you know, put into jail. But he, through, you know, through those 40 years, essentially formed friendships with other uh, people of other nationality, Jews, Russians, uh, you know, Greeks, whatever, with whoever, and, you know, in the gulag during those times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was a a real marvel to actually see him be freed, because Mm -hmm. in essence, he bought Ukraine's independence and sovereignty by paying this price of being in jail for 40 years as did others, and for example, Mahatma Gandhi, in the suffering that they were prepared to endure for the sake of achieving these high, high goals that they had, their nation for their people. Mm-hmm. You know, so you have to revere these people and uh, you know, learn from their experience as best you can, mm-hmm. and be, you know, follow their values, try to you know, uphold the values that they have uh, you know brought forward for us to to cherish and to uh, respect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. So, sir, I'm glad that you are aware of this heinous crime committed by the British, especially the genocide caused by the Churchill in India. Even someone like Rishi Sunak, who is who is of Indian heritage and the former PM of the UK, I do remember once he tweeted and glorified Churchill. I can totally understand that he definitely does things for the betterment of his country, the UK. But but I wish he had avoided hurting Indian sentiments by not vocalizing or glorifying Churchill, you know? I I would say it's our duty to know our history as best as possible. That's basically. And then to honor and respect, you know, uh, like human rights and, and, uh, you know, fear uh, those who who stood up for the rights of people. So, sir, you've been... You have been a Forbes contributor for 10 years, and over 1 million readers have read your article on immigration. So can you right. share your experience with us, how it's been working with Forbes? Okay, yeah. So first of all, how I became a Forbes uh, correspondent, and that was, uh, I we talked earlier about my being a UN correspondent, and yep. uh, it was in my bi- it's in my biography. I have a website called myworkvisa.com, hmm. which is my personal website. And there, there's my biography. And uh, what I used to do is uh, I used to read articles about immigration on Forbes. And from time to time, I would post under the articles comments on whatever other writers were writing in the immigration field. And I guess over time, Forbes editors figured out, who is this guy that's posting this stuff? Let's take a look at who he is. And they looked up my biography and they saw I was a UN correspondent. And I think that's why they approached me. The first and one and only time in my life when I was ever asked, you know, hey, could you come and do something for us? Unlike every other time where I've had to pursue employers and pursue opportunities and make submissions and try to win contests or whatever it is. On this occasion, they approached me saying, and even then I had to post, and a friend of mine who worked with me 
uh, Sean Barry, who's uh, a social media type, he was the one that would help me post articles or post comments under uh, under uh, uh, columns and were written by other Forbes writers. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had to do that. But eventually, they contacted me and said, hey, could you write articles about immigration? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And so I've been writing for them for 10 years now. I just wrote an article today again, this one about a big change in U.S. immigration law related to a, a former case, a longtime case that used to be a precedent that's been overturned. It's called the Chevron Doctrine was overturned. And so I wrote an article about it for Forbes. Anyway, to write an article, you have, you know, it's usually somewhere between, say, 750 words and 1,100 words hmm. is the norm. And, uh, you know, so someone can read it in about five minutes. And, uh, you know, I, I, I look for something that a topic that I'm, I have some angle on or I have interest in. Yeah. I try to find that angle to approach the article on that I think is, you know, useful. Yeah. And then a premise, what is the premise that I work with in writing the article? Or in the case of the Chevron doctrine that I just talked about, mm-hmm. I knew that that was a pivotal case in immigration. I knew a long time ago people were saying someday that thing's going to be overturned. I didn't even know what the case was. I just heard that people were saying, lawyers were saying, mm-hmm. that case is about to be overturned and they were concerned about it. So when I saw it was overturned, I, I read up about it. Mm-hmm. I didn't have any opinions about it until I read up about it. And then I realized, yeah, it was significant because it overturned 40 years of administrative law mm-hmm. uh, in the area of immigration. So I came up with the idea, I'm going to write about how the Chevron Doctrine's destruction is going to impact the U.S. immigration uh, system. Mm-hmm. That was the, and then what I would do is that, you know, I use chat GPT, by the way, as a mm-hmm. uh, way to generate ideas or to give me a draft of something I can work with, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so That's if interesting. Uh, Chevron doc, uh, Doctrine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you'll get a little write-up about it, right? And you can use that. You say, oh, well, that's the way you do it. Okay, so you do it. But the thing is, you cannot use it as your article. You mm-hmm. can use it as a generator for ideas, for yeah. head, you know, for how you would uh, title an article. Yeah. Uh, but you have to make it your article. Yeah, yeah. And the only way to do that is you've got to come up with your ideas to include in the article, mm-hmm. you know, and to rewrite what's generated as your mm-hmm. work. Yeah. It's very, it's very um, challenging to be sure that it's your work and not some computer out there uh, writing for you. Yeah. But if you do it, then, you know, it, it can help you a lot. Yeah. And yeah. so about that, and that's the way I do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People often consider that when we discover electricity for the first time, when we discover the engine, the computer, internet, and the same as in this AI models, the generative AI, Right. Yes, you're yeah. right. It's uh, at first you're scared of it. You don't know what's going to happen with it. Yeah. And then you get used to it, and, and it becomes part of your you know day to day activities. So that's yeah. what's happened. So, sir, I'm really impressed that you are not just aware of ChatGPT, but actually using it in your work. That's really impressive, I would say. So, what do you think? How often people from your age group aware or using this kind of technology? Oh, I think it's becoming a major influence in our life. Like, uh, you know, for me, drafting letters, for example, or uh, coming up with an idea for a title, uh, or, um, you know, uh, rewriting something that's hard, that's mm-hmm. not going for you, you know, you put it in there, ask it to take a crack at it before you yeah, go yeah. back at it, you know, things like that. I mean, people who are in their 70s, what do you think? How often people are their 70s use this kind of tool? The older you get, the the less you're conversant with technology and computers. Exactly. Uh, So, you know, I've had to stay up with it because of my work. You know, like I've decided to stay working and uh, stay in tune with, uh, you know, the the world as it's going along in my field. Young people working with me all the time who are challenging me to, you know, to stay up on these things. So I'm staying up. But I don't think most 70-year-olds are up to date on this yeah. kind of stuff. So it's a challenge for, for many of yeah. them. 
but i'm really glad sir i mean you are doing this <laughs> your this is you are using the cutting edge technology i mean i am really applauding for you thank you so sir we are on the last segment of the podcast this is the rapid fire round which we call instant insights i will ask you some quick question you have to yeah. answer as fast as you can okay so sir are you ready <laughs> yeah coffee or tea coffee cats or dogs cats i don't dogs sorry which are mountains mountains city or countryside city blue or green blue early bird or night owl early bird now night owl when i was a young man hmm introvert or extrovert introvert if you could change three things about the world what would it be i would change the climate so that we don't get baked off this earth hmm. uh i would uh i would teach people to be kind hmm. no matter what to be kind and uh i would invest everything possible in in, in the education of people young people Mm. Great. Yeah. Travel back in time or forward in time? I I'm afraid I'm a historian back back in time. <laughs> yeah. If you could if you could have any dinner guest dead or alive who would it be? Uh, it's a tough question but one that would I would like it would be Pope John Paul II. Mm. Best legal advice you have given. Record everything after the conversation or while it's being uh, while it's going on. Mm. Law or journalism. That's a tough one. Uh, journalism. Mm. Okay, if you weren't a lawyer or journalist, what would you be? I'd be a musician. Hmm. Most challenging part of your job? Uh, staying up to uh, up to date on uh, requirements. Hmm. Most rewarding part of your job? cultivating young leaders to be what they can be hmm. favorite book of all time okay that's a very difficult one um oh. uh i'll i'll share this i i can't give you i i've got a number of books and it would be hard to do that but i'll i'll tell you this right now i'm reading victor hugo's les misérables and it's hmm. definitely the top books i've ever read hmm. favorite movie of all time movie yep um the great escape the great escape hmm. drama or comedy comedy fiction or non fiction non fiction best thing about being a lawyer um freedom to travel and do what you want hmm. worst thing about being a lawyer uh uh staying uh staying within the rules of the law societies or the uh, the bar <laughs> associations So sir you have seen the world both before and after the digital age the pre and post internet era based on your past experience what are the three things that you that your generation had that the new generation lacks uh okay one is a sense of conge uh, what's the word congeniality among mm -hmm. friends especially close friends in high school uh for example um because of hardship 
uh, that, that molded uh, uh, loyalty and friendship among people. Hmm. Uh, and and uh, we didn't spend time on a computer phoning each other or, you know, on a cell phone talking to each other. We talked in person. Hmm. Second thing was hitchhiking all over the world. I hitchhiked all over North America. Hmm. You know, like uh, uh, standing on the side of the road with my thumb out and a car would come stop and take me. It take me, you know, 3,000 miles hmm. with some stranger that I never met. Um, I think that uh, a sense of history that life, you know, that there are, are that uh, history is forming with everything that is happening. You know, all your actions are adding up into a history. Hmm. Like, uh, you see history backwards, but you can't see it forward. So uh, th this sense of uh, tracking what's going on and, and uh, seeing how uh, what you do, the consequences of what you do over time uh, is very significant. Mm. That's beautiful, sir. Yeah. And vice versa, what are the three things that the younger generation has that your generation lacks? Well, number one is understanding computers way better than we ever did. Second thing is being more educated than we are as adults, like just because of the computer generation and the internet and everything like that, being far more informed at their age than we were at when we were at their age. Mm -hmm. uh, and the capacity to travel all over the world and meet all kinds of new people from the other side of the world is something that we never had. Yep, yep. All the three things which you said, we are lucky because we're born in the era where this kind of technology exists. Right. Yeah, it's pure luck, I guess, in a sense. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So, sir, one last question. Yeah. What's the best piece of advice you have ever received? I'll give you this advice. Uh, it, it's from uh, Zig Ziglar, who is a popular American speaker. He's dead now, but he was a great leader at one time. Hmm. And he said this, you can get anything in life that you want, so long as you help enough other people get what they want. I, I try to abide by that, by that philosophy. There's two forms of philosophy that can, roughly speaking, that can be followed in the world. The one is sort of along this line. You can get whatever you want so long as you help enough other people get what they want. It's sort of the golden rule. Treat others as you, as you would have them treat you. It's sort of modified a little bit. The other one is give me what I want and to help with everybody else. I don't care what happens to everybody else. That's the philosophy that's ruling, destroying the world today, in my opinion. Wow. That's such a great uh, advice, sir. Yeah. Thanks for sharing with us today. Okay. Yeah. So, sir, this is the end of the podcast. Any final thought? A great talking to you, Sri. Thank you for uh, interviewing me. And uh, yeah. please send me a copy of your program once you got it edited. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Hello, everyone. If you are on YouTube, please subscribe to Sri's podcast, The Billion Insights. If you're listening on Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, please take a moment to rate us five stars if you enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your insight with us today. Your stories and insights were truly inspiring. From your work in immigration law to your writings and personal experiences, you have given us a lot to think about. We appreciate your taking the time to be with us. We wish you good health and happiness. Great talking to you. Thanks. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, All sir. The best to you, Sri. All Thank the best to you. Thank you, sir. And a listener, if you want to know more about Mr. Andy and his work, all the links can be found in the description. See you next time on the Billion Insight Podcast. Until next time, dream big and work hard. This is Sri, your host, signing out. Peace.